Right. It is time to begin, and uh, I am thankful for all of you who are here. I have been given the impossible task of trying to finish up Second Peter in one morning, and uh, in less than 45 minutes. So we will see how that goes. What I want to start with is, is here in Second Peter chapter 2, uh, and, and I want to pull these chapters together if I can. In 2 Peter chapter 2, there are really three main points in 2 Peter chapter 2 that you need to remember. Number one is, don't be thrown that there are false teachers because there always have been. That's number one. Number two is that false teachers bring in destructive heresies and a lot of people are going to follow them. And number three, in the end, the false teacher will be destroyed. And that's that's what 2 Peter chapter 2 really is all about. And we'll look at those verses in a minute. Then when you move into chapter 3, he mentions at least one thing that false teachers are teaching. And that is that Jesus isn't going to come again. And so he talks about that and, and uh, talks about those teachers and then gives us evidence that we can believe that Jesus Christ is coming again and what's going to happen with that. And then he ends that chapter with that these things are true. It ought to make a difference in our life. It's the same idea, I think, that, that Andy was talking about this morning. Instead of the response to the resurrection, it's the response to the second coming. But that's really what he talks about in these things. So let's spend a little time together, and I hope that it's going to be helpful. Look at verses 1 through 3 of 2 Peter chapter 2. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. We're going to talk about what all that means real briefly for a moment. But he gives you some characteristics of false teachers. And uh, he says, number one, that they're more interested in gaining popularity in the, than they are in telling the truth. In the Old Testament, the prophet said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, I think about uh, in the days of, of Jehoshaphat, Zedekiah said, oh, you're going to win, put on some iron horns and pushed everybody around to say, God's going to drive out all your enemies. And then there was Micaiah who said, no, this is the word of God. You're not going to win. In fact, you're going to die if you go out there. Well, they listened to the one that had the more popular message. And as a result of that, they died. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 22 is where you'll find that. False prophets are interested in telling you what you want to hear more than telling you the truth. A second thing that he's going to tell you is that false prophets were generally more interested in personal gain. I remember all the way back. And remember he says they used to be and they still are. They're always going to be. There's always going to be false prophets. In Micah chapter 3 verse 11 Micah said, the priests teach for hire and the prophets divine for money. They were interested in money. In the third place, false prophets had always been interested in living the life they wanted rather than living the life that God intends for them to have. So Isaiah says in Isaiah 28 verse 7, the priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are confused with wine. And then in Jeremiah, he talks about the false prophet. He says, in the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers. They lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness. Again, that's Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 14, and all the way down into verse 32. So they led people further away from God instead of closer to God. And he says, they bring in destructive heresies. I would love to spend more time telling you what a heresy is. The word heresis didn't really originally mean something bad. It meant a choice. Like when a doctor uh, looks at a disease and he has several different treatments that could be given to that disease, he would make a choice of one particular one. Well, that originally was called a heresy. It's just a choice that he made. But it came to mean making a choice to follow something other than the truth of God. And there's the choice to fall or go in a different direction than God goes. And he says they're going to bring those in and they're destructive heresies. 
when I turn from the truth to my opinion or anybody else's opinion, that's a heresy. They denied the Lord who bought them. Now that may mean that they denied that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And certainly there were some who denied that. There were some who denied that Jesus came in the flesh and, and that was it. But I, I think that maybe the thing under consideration here is that uh, they're denying the Lord by the way they live and the things that they say, they're denying the Lord. Now let me give you maybe an example of that. If, if a guy says that he loves his wife with all his heart, and he says that all the time, but he's unfaithful to her all the time, then he lies about his love. He's denying the wife that he claims to love because he's unfaithful to her. If you have a friend that claims to be your friend for life, that he will always be your friend, but then he's constantly disloyal to you, and during those times where you need someone to stand with you, he's always somewhere else, and maybe even on the other side, what's he doing? He is lying about the friendship. When a person lives their life in a way that dishonors Christ, they're lying and denying the Lord who bought them. That's really the idea behind this. Uh, and the end of those men, he says, is destruction. If you look at verses 2 and 3, he says four things here about false teachers and their teaching. Number one, he says that their cause of it is ambition and greed. That they're greedy. Remember verse 3 particularly? That in their greed they lead other people astray. In the second place, you see the method of their teaching. They have cunningly forged arguments that they use. I want to just make a short application here for a second, but I hope that it will be helpful. Any time that a congregation says for the next year or two years, we're going to make an in-depth study about instrumental music, I want to tell you what they've already decided before they ever start the study. They already know what they want to do. And at the end of it, surprise, surprise, they've decided that instrumental music is okay. When they want to do an in-depth study about women's role in worship, they say, we're going to take a year and study women's role in worship and in leadership. You already know what they're going to do. They've already decided. But they're going to make arguments during that year. They're going to make arguments during that period of time so that they will be able to sell you on that idea. False teachers use cunningly devised arguments. It's what they do. Uh, that's the way that they get people who really don't see what's real in following that. If, if you've never really seen a $100 bill and looked at it, uh, you might be fooled by a fake $100 bill, by a counterfeit. But if you spend a lot of time looking at the $100 bill, you won't be faked. I, by the way, I found out something about $100 bills the other day. You, you might not know this. I didn't know this. You can take a toothpick, and there are two places in a $100 bill where you can slide the toothpick in without breaking the $100 bill. It's made in two layers, and you can tell if it's real, if you can put a toothpick through those two little places right in the center of the bill. I didn't know that. That's really the truth. So if it looks like a $100 bill, but you can't slide the toothpick, it's fake, okay? The more you know about the real thing, the less you... But, but people will follow their argument because they don't know what the reality is. And it says uh, the effect of their false teaching is, number one, that encourage people to follow them in their own immorality. And number two, he says that it brings Christianity in disrepute, that people look at the way they live and want nothing to do with Christianity. And the end of that, again, he says, is destruction. Look at verses 4 through 11. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what was going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued the righteous lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then 
Notice he's given these examples. He said, if, if he's done these things, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, through, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. He mentioned several things here that are just really unusual. Number one, God didn't spare the angels that sinned. This idea of the angels that sinned in, in the intertestamental books, there was a whole fable about how angels sinned and, and they applied the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis to mean the angels, which it doesn't mean, and, and the people of the earth, humans, that angels and humans intermarried and that was the reason that the angels sinned. They weren't supposed to do it. That's not the teaching of Genesis at all. If you, if you look back and see it in context, you know that that's not what it's talking about. And yet, there's these very interesting statements that you get hints about what angels did in, in sinning. If you go to the book of Revelation, which I never recommend as a place to go to find basic Bible doctrine, you're going to find there a lot of figurative, uh, apocalyptic type literature. But it always talks in Revelation about the war in heaven and the angels being cast out and all of that. I don't think that was talking about this, but... Uh, let, me just, let me just look at Jude chapter 1, verse 6. Listen. The angels who did not stay within their own position and authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So there were angels that left where they were supposed to be and as a result received condemnation. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says, that of those who are sinful on the day of judgment... He will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So there was a punishment for the devil and his angels. Where did those angels come from? If God made everything, it ought to tell you where those angels actually came from. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Apparently... God's people, in one form or another, are going to judge the unfaithful angels. It's what we do. It's what we're going to be doing on that day. And then 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, tells you the motivation, at least behind Satan. He says of elders, he can't be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. What made the devil, Satan, fight against God and, and carry people with him? Pride did that. Pride did that. And as a result of that, he fell. So there's all sorts of, of hints in Scripture about this. But he says, God put those angels that sinned in pits of darkness, or some translations say chains of darkness, that that's where they were. In other words, God punishes the wicked. He, he knows how to punish the wicked. Uh, don't think that he doesn't. If you looked at the, at the last part of the last uh, verse 3, it talks about, you know, in, in the Old Testament, when a person was a false prophet, he said, you take him out and you kill him. And yet there are false prophets now and they're not dropping dead. And you and I don't have the right to go and kill them, okay? That's not what we do. And here's what he's telling them. Even though you may not see it, God hasn't forgotten and he will punish the evildoer and he will reward the righteous. Even though you might not see it instantly happen, don't think that God has lost his consideration or his commitment to punishing the wicked and saving the righteous because that's what he's done all along. He mentions the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the deliverance of Lot. And the point that he's making is God knows how to do this. He hasn't forgotten how to punish the wicked. He hasn't forgotten how to rescue the righteous. Trust him when you feel like you're persecuted. Trust him. He knows how to rescue you. He gives us a picture in verses 9 through 11 of the, of the evil man. He says he's a desire-dominated man. He says that he's shameless uh, in this, that he's not ashamed of anything that he does. And he's self-willed, which is probably even more uh, than just self-willed, but committed to pleasing only himself. It's what he does. And then it says in verses 13, or it says there in the last part of that, that he's contemptuous 
of the glorious ones. What does that mean? He's talking about angels there. And, and he goes on to talk about angels in the very next verse to identify who the glorious ones are. That they blaspheme angels. That's an interesting thing. What are they saying? Well, they might be saying that angels don't really do anything. They might be saying that angels don't even exist. They're blaspheming angels when the angels wouldn't blaspheme them. In other words, the angels don't stand before God and say of you, look at that person, look what, look what sin they have. They don't accuse you like that. They don't blaspheme against you, speak against. And the word blaspheme means speak against. But those who are false teachers speak against the angels. In what sense? Well, turn over to Hebrews chapter 1 and look at verses 13 and 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are in, to inherit salvation? What's he telling you there? What he's telling you there is something really, really significant. That angels work for you. Angels are actually involved in our world. When, when Jacob had his vision and he saw a ladder, what did he see? He saw angels going up and down that ladder. Okay? When you look in the book of Revelation and the bowl of incense is carried before God, it's carried by the angels, and he says the bowl is the prayers of the saints. Who carries your prayer to the presence of God? Apparently the angels do. Angels are agents of God's providence on earth and working out his ultimate plan. It's what they do. There's a whole lot we'd love to say about angels, but the point is these guys are blaspheming angels like, well, there's no angel that's taking care of me. There's nobody here. They're not doing anything for me. Uh, they may not even exist, really. It's probably just a myth. He says, no, they're real, and, and they're really here, and you don't blaspheme angels. Look at verses 12 through 14. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. They are accursed children. He says, this is who they are. He's talking about these false teachers that are living immoral lives, and he says some really remarkable things about them. Number, first is, they are people who follow their instincts and not truth, and they're just like brute beasts. And he says, what does a brute beast do that's destroying people? What do you do? Well, you capture and kill it. He said, that's the end of these people. That's actually what's going to happen, that they will be captured and killed in their own sin. I wish I could spend more time with that. When he says their eyes are full of adultery, uh, if you go back and you look at the Greek there and you look at what he actually says, it means that the false teacher looks at every woman as a potential conquest. That's the idea behind it, uh, is that they are looking as, as to sexually win over every woman, and that's what they're trying to do. And he says this, he's a bad man. In the end, he gets caught in his own wrongdoing, and part of his destruction, part of his punishment, is the result of his own action while he's still here. Uh, the more you engage in lust, the more lust it takes to get to where you get the same level of satisfaction. The more you take drugs, the more drugs you have to take in order to get the same level of high. And after a while, you get beyond the point of being able to live in that pleasure. Everything is just a pursuit to try to find it again. He said, that's the way it is for the people who live like that. Look at verses 15 and 16. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Now you'd have to go to Numbers chapters 22 through 25 and actually then on over to chapter 31 to get this. But Balaam was a prophet of God who was offered a big amount of money by Balak to go curse the children of Israel when they were going through the area of Moab. 
And he really liked the idea of getting that kind of money. So he's on his way when an angel of the Lord stops and he can't see it, but his donkey can. And he starts beating his donkey and then his donkey starts talking to him and he's so upset he doesn't even notice it's the donkey at first. And, and then suddenly he realizes there really is an angel there and the angel scares him to death and he says, you're only going to say what God says. So he tells Balak, that's what I have to do. And three times... Balak tried to get him to curse the children of Israel. Three times he blessed them, but every time he really wanted the money. He was after the money. So what happens in the end is in, verse, in chapter 25 that Balak sends his pretty young women down among the children of Israel and they commit adultery and then God starts destroying the children of Israel. Now where did he get that idea? Listen to chapter 31 verse 16. Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. In other words, what happened is, he says, look, just go ahead and pay me. I can't curse them, but I can tell you how to make God curse them. If you'll send your young women down there and they commit adultery, God will destroy them himself. And that's exactly what God did. As a result of that, by the way, Balaam ends up dying, not the death of the righteous that he asked for, but he ends up being killed when so many of the others are killed. Okay, uh, look at verses 17 through 22. These are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passion to the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. And whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they've escaped the defilement to the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. All that sort of fits together. He says, look, here's what's happening. These false teachers are really preying on people who have just barely escaped from the world already. I mean, they, they've left behind the lifestyle that they used to live as a Gentile. They're hanging on. They're really trying to hang on to live the life in Christ. And then these guys come along and say, oh, you're worried about the wrong stuff. None of that really matters. You're free to do whatever. After all, grace is big enough to cover you in anything that you have. And they end up falling right back into what they were doing before, except now it's worse. He said it would be worse to have known it and then given it up than never to have known it in the first place. He says that's like the dog going back to its vomit and the sow that you've just scrubbed going back to wallow in the mud. He said that's the same thing. He said, it's a terrible thing to go back. By the way, for uh, those who say that once you're saved, you're always saved, this passage says that can't be true. That's not true. That when you go back to where you used to live and live that way again, it's worse than it was before you ever became a Christian. What does that mean? Now, what it means is that you lose your soul. You lose your soul, and the punishment is terrible for having done it. So, yes, you can be a Christian and then become lost. Don't ever believe anybody who tells you once saved, always saved. The Scripture never says that. Uh, does it say that God will preserve you? Yes. Does it say you must persevere? Yes. It says both those things, which is really remarkable. If you take just the passage that says, and God will make you stand, or God will cause this to occur, uh, as you look in 1 Corinthians and other places where it makes those statements, that just proves once saved, always saved, until you read the rest of the book. And the rest of the book says, in order for you to be saved, you must persevere, you must be faithful, you must not give up. Is God... Doing this, yes. Or is there something we must do? The Bible absolutely says yes. You put those two things together, and what it means is that if I don't let go, if I try to hold on to God, even when sometimes I fail, God will save me. He's strong enough and great enough to do that. But if I live in rebellion and go back to the way that I used to live, I'm going to be lost. 
God is able to make me stand, and he will make me stand if I don't let go of him, if I let go of him. Yes, I can be lost again. Well, and then he goes into a specific kind of thing that is being taught. Now, there are others that were being taught, but this one is, is about what they need to remember. He says, now this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, and I'm going to go down through verse 18. Beloved, uh, well, let me, I'll stop at different places. This is the second writer that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through his apostles. He says, I keep telling you the things that you already know so that you won't forget them. Uh, every once in a while, I hear people say, you know, every preacher should be original every single week. Every teacher should be original every single week. No, that's not true. Every preacher should teach the truth every single week. Every teacher should teach the truth every single week. Which means that there are some things that are precept upon precept, line upon line, and I need to be remembered and re reminded and remember those things again and again and again because you get caught up in everything else and you just let it slide. You forget. Uh, the problem of time. Uh, the Greeks had this incredible statement about time. They said it was a proverb, time which erases all things. It is possible for me to know it and then forget that I know it. And if I don't have somebody reminding me, then that's what Peter said. I'm not making any apologies here. I'm trying to stir up your mind by way of reminder that you should remember what the prophets and the commandment of the Lord is and what the apostles have told you. And, and then he says, as he said at the first part of the other, there are false prophets among them and there are false prophets among us. Just as there were false prophets then, here's some of what the false prophets are saying now. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. He said, listen, one of the things that these people are teaching, and something you need to know is that what drives them is not their logic. What drives them is their lust. They're walking after their own lust, and so they're denying that he's coming again. And the argument they're using, a cunningly devised argument that he talked about in chapter 2, is here's one of them. They said, look, it's been decades. Jesus said he was going to come again, and it has been decades, and he hasn't come. In fact, not only has he not come, but nothing has really changed. Everything is just like it's always been. And if he hasn't come in decades, then he's not coming. All of these people, the Thessalonians and others, they've been looking for the coming of the Lord. They have, they have said Maranatha all the time, our Lord come. They, they've been talking about it. They've been praying about it. They've been looking for it. People are still dying and, and, and still the Lord hasn't come. So apparently he's not coming. That's the argument that they're making. He's not coming. It's been decades so obviously, the Lord is not coming. That's their argument. Why do they make that argument? Listen, he says they are scoffers, number one, because they're trying to promote themselves. Number two, they're walking after their own evil desires. They're following their own sinful desires. Um, when, you, when you follow the truth, it reminds you again and again that there are things that you have to do, changes that you have to make. If you don't want to make those changes, then what do you do? You deny the truth of what the Bible actually says. You make sure you deny that truth. It's like someone told me a long time ago, if you pray regularly, you are reminded of the sin that you need to be forgiven of. If you don't want to think about that sin, then you quit praying. And then you don't have to think about that sin so much. These people are walking after their own desires because they don't want to think that there's a judgment. They don't want to think that there's a second coming. They don't want to think that these things that I'm doing right now really matter. And so my sinful desire changes the way I look at things. That's the way it happens all the time. I remember a number of years ago, there was a lady who left her husband for someone else. The husband had been faithful and... Uh, 
she left her husband for someone else. And when her mother found out about it, she asked me to go with her and we sat down with the young woman. And her mother said, you understand that you have really wrecked your life and your marriage and your kids. She said, and, and you don't have the right to be with this man. You don't have the right to get married again. This is something you, you cannot do. Three years later, the mother said, oh, I think it's okay that she's married. You know, you know what happened? I, I want to have a relationship with my daughter, and I managed to figure out a way to justify that she left her husband, committed adultery with somebody else, and is living with him now. She feels that she somehow has figured out a way to do that. We change our doctrinal positions because of what we want, when in fact, I need to gauge what I want against what God says and then change my wants to what God wants. It's a difficult thing to do, but it's what he expects us to do. Okay, now here's what Peter says in answer to the people who says that the world's always been this way and therefore the Lord isn't coming. Verse 5, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And by that means, uh, and, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He's saying they forget that everything hasn't always been the same. You know, if you, if you look at the pre-flood world and look at the post-flood world, the systems are different. Things are different there. Uh, there was apparently a water jacket around the pre-flood world that isn't there now. Those heavens opened up and it came down to earth. There are a lot of things that are different in the way that things work. He said, things have not always been the same on this planet. Why would you think that they're always going to stay the same? If you know your Bible, he says, it wasn't like this always. Things have changed. And so all things haven't continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Things are different now than they were then. So expect that things will be different in the future. That's what he's telling you. But listen to what he says beginning at verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. That old world stored up for water. But these are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Just like the flood was a judgment of God and a destruction of the ungodly, this will be that day when it is destroyed in fire, and it's a day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Well, look at the next thing. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, go, let me stop right there and just take a moment, because we're running out of time really quick. But I want you to get this, okay? Here's the point that he's making. He says, you think it's been a long time because it's been decades. To God, that's no time at all. A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Please don't take that in a literal way to say, well, that means that every day is a thousand years, every thousand years is a day. It's not what it means. It means time doesn't work the same with God. God knows what he's doing, and whether it's a day or a thousand years doesn't really matter. Or as someone said not long ago that I really liked, that if you think that it's been decades, and for us it's been 2,000 years, and still the Lord hasn't come back, for the Lord that's just a couple of days. It's a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. That's not much time for God. And in comparison to eternity where God lives, that's almost no time at all. It's a snap of a finger. When he wants to come back, he's going to. The fact that it's been decades or a thousand or two thousand years doesn't mean he's not going to keep his promise. God's going to keep his promise. And he is going to come back again. And that's the way that it is. Now, he says uh, he's not slow. You may think that it's slow because to you it's slow. It's funny how time works differently for different people. When I was a little boy, i tell you what, time went so slow. And if you asked me how old I was, I would have said, and when I was four, I'm four and a half because I really wanted to get to five in a hurry. Okay, and I was working, it was just so slow between birthdays. Have you noticed as you've gotten older, it's so fast between birthdays? Same amount of hours, same amount of days. Oh, it seems so different. 
Time works differently depending on where you are. Well, God's in eternity. Time works differently to him, even more so than us. So I need to see it from God's perspective. But look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements... Uh, let me get this again. Okay, and the, and, okay. I've, I've somehow looked at the wrong place. Okay, the day of the Lord will come as a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a uh, great roar, and a he heavenly bodies will burn up and be dissolved. I'm reading from the ESV, so it throws me. And the earth and the works that are in it will be exposed. This is what it says in the ESV. Now, what he's telling you is that this is going to happen, that the day is coming. It's coming when you don't expect it, just like a thief doesn't send you an invitation and says on Thursday night at, uh, 12, uh, at 1230 in the morning, I'm going to go in and rob your house. Just thought you ought to know if you'd like to be gone at that time, please feel free. Thieves don't tell you that. Otherwise, you'd be ready for them. He says that's the way the day of the Lord is going to come. You're not going to expect it. But here's what's going to happen. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The elements will melt with fervent heat is probably the more accurate translation of that. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Somebody says, I really think that means that it will be revealed that that's the way that it's going to happen. It's not what it means at all. And we'll talk about that. How do I know that? Because of the first part of verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved. Dissolved means coming apart to its basic constituent points. In other words, everything comes apart. Even the atoms begin to fly apart. Everything comes apart. They're dissolved, okay? What's going to be dissolved? Well, he says the heavens, the elements, the earth, and the works that are in it. All that's coming apart. For anybody who thinks there's, we're going to be back on this earth, this earth won't be here. All of this is going to be dissolved. And, and if you have uh, the, the translation as the ESV has it, instead of the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, which is what it says in the King James, the New King James, the American Standard, and most translations, uh, then why do they pick exposed? Because some of the earlier translations of Scripture said exposed. Uh, some of the earlier versions of Scripture say exposed. Most versions say burned up. And so they say, if you're going to, if you, if you know something about, about criticism, biblical criticism, where you try to determine what text is actually the best text, one of the rules of thumb, which I don't always agree with, and I, I find kind of a silly thing, but this is what they do, that if it doesn't make sense, that's the one you pick. Uh, so you don't find yourself picking just the one you want. And that's where this came from. Because exposed, if it means revealed or, or shown, doesn't make sense with the text. What does make sense is that it's burned up. And the reason is, is because it's all going to be dissolved. It's all going to go. But those of you who've uh, been in my classes very often know that the word exposed, it had a very specific meaning. And it doesn't mean revealed. Uh, the word has a very specific meaning that when a parent had a child they didn't want, in Greek and Roman society, they threw that child out, and they either put it at the fountains of Rome or just threw it out, or maybe even killed it and threw it out, and there was no legal recourse for having done that. They didn't want it, and so they threw it out. The earth and the works that are in it are going to be thrown out. God's not going to need them anymore. He doesn't want them anymore. He throws them out. That's the idea of being exposed. Now, here's what he says. Since all these things, this is verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, and this is where he turns to what's our response. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and and desiring, this says hastening in the ESV, but it's earnestly desiring. Earnestly desiring the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. But according to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He says, this is what you ought to be. You've got false teachers out there on all sorts of levels, but what do I want you to be? I want you to live lives of holiness Godliness, stay close to God. I want you to be waiting and earnestly desiring 
that he's going to come again because all these false teachers will be gone at that point and death will be no more. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And, and we are waiting for a new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. I want a place where I don't have to put up with sinful temptation for me or have to see the unrighteousness of people unfold all around our world. When you read the newspapers or watch the, uh, watch the television or get your news on, on the internet, some of the most perverse, awful, and inhumane things that it could possibly imagine are happening in our world every day, every day. And because they want to sell more papers, then uh, papers and news outlets are very willing to put that right in your face every single day. Wouldn't it be great to get up and open up a newspaper and everything in it is good news? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I, I remember Beverly and I traveled to uh, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, just after 9-11. We were going to go to South Africa. All flights were canceled. And so we decided to take a couple of weeks instead and go to some places in West Texas and New, New Mexico and other places we'd never been. And we stopped one night in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And here was the thing that I loved about it. I, got, I bought a paper and I looked at the paper and while everything everywhere was covering uh, the catastrophe of 9-11, the front page big picture was the teenage boy who had won the prize for the best bull in the county fair. And I read the entire paper and not one word was about anything outside the county. And I thought, you know what? I think I'd like to live in truth or consequences. I, I love the fact that it was all good news. Uh, can I just tell you that it's gonna all be good news because the only news there is is good news when you're living in heaven. And we're through uh, our time. We've took you about two minutes over. I apologize for that. But I hope it gives you kind of a flavor of what Second Peter is really all about. Let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you that you've given us these moments and we thank you that we have a destiny. We thank you that this world is headed toward a conclusion and that for your people, that's the best news ever. Help us, Father, to live our lives in godliness and holiness and faith. Help us to anticipate and earnestly desire the coming of Jesus for ourselves. Help us to one day live in such a way that we will hear his voice say, come home. And what a day that will be. Father, in the meantime, help us to stand up against those who try to destroy others. Help us to be the people who do not get discouraged because there are those who choose to live their lives in lust and sin and for popularity. Help us instead to live for you, for your truth, and for your son. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.